Hello, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Esri Agriculture Team webinar titled Optimize Data Collection, Crop Scouting and Asset Inspection. My name is Charlie Magruder. In our webinar today, we'll be highlighting Esri's suite of field applications that will transform your field data collection activities and processes through a unified workflow. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted in the next few days. As a participant, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to that recording. We'd encourage you to enter questions for us in the GoToWebinar questions dialog box as we go through the presentation today. We will answer as many questions as time permits towards the end of the session or follow up after webinar if we do run out of time. I'd like to introduce your presenters to you today that will be guiding you through this webinar. As I mentioned, my name is Charlie Magruder. I'm a senior account executive with Esri's agriculture team. I'm located in Kansas City, Missouri, which is the home of your Super Bowl 54 champion, Kansas City Chiefs. Elvis Takao is a solution engineer on our agriculture team and is a member of the natural resources group like myself. Also is Eric Gackstatter. He's a principal GNSS technologist at Discovery Management Group and is based in Portland, Oregon. So let's take a quick review of our agenda before we get started. I'll be making some introductory comments and then turn things over to Elvis to walk us through some of the specific applications and the demonstrations using a template that we'll be offering to you as well, all around our theme of optimizing data collection. Then Eric will walk us through a solution that our company his company implemented along with the Esri Business Partner EOS Positioning Systems for Harlan Estate. This presentation will showcase Harlan's reason for selecting an ArcGIS solution and we'll discuss the value gained from it. At the end, again, there'll be time for questions and answers. Let's start with a few comments on who we are and what we do. We're a software company focused on mapping technology called ArcGIS. We've enjoyed our 50th year of business last summer and we continue to lead the world in geospatial technology. At Esri, we are driven by research, spending more than 25% of our annual revenue on research and development. We do so that we can continue to deliver innovative technology that harnesses the power of applied geography. We continue to modernize and grow our platform to keep pace with changes in technology and meet the needs of our more than 1 million users. We're a global company with more than 80 offices around the world and employ people from more than 65 different countries. Our number one goal still is to support you with your needs for the best spatially enabled technology. We give you the power to integrate all types of data with maps and apps so you can visualize, analyze, and solve your spatial needs. Everything starts with ArcGIS here. Our core technology helps you build, manage, share, and find meaning in a multitude of data sources. The enterprise ArcGIS system is unique in that your system can be set up in many ways to meet your individual organization structure or needs. Having, Arc Arc having ArcGIS configured the way you want ultimately leads to making better, smarter decisions, as well as gaining insight into your operations. Today, for our purposes, we'll focus on the mobile technologies of ArcGIS. Here we see some typical organizational tasks or segments of data collection that clients want through a mobile environment. To support these operations, we have a whole suite of applications that allow organizations the ability to become more efficient, increase accuracy, and optimize their data collection. And so here we see examples of ArcGIS tools for implementing those segments in order to streamline workflows and utilize analysis methods and reporting. These products can be used individually as well as in conjunction with each other. Today we'll be showing some of that paired ability through a series of apps used for crop scouting. Crop scouting is an essential process for many of our agriculture customers. Among the tasks that organizations use our mobile platform tools for are assessing pests, monitoring crop health, and evaluating yield potential. 
So let's look at a workflow or workflow possibilities these tools can be used for. Here we have a set of workflow examples that we're showing the connection of applications for different use cases. As I mentioned previously, these tools will be used independently, can be used independently, and in many different configurations or associations. For today's presentation, we'll focus on this collect and monitor section of our examples. So here's a simplified diagram of what our collect and monitor activities will be. We'll be using Survey123, Quick Capture, and the Operation Dashboard today. As a background, ArcGIS Quick Capture is an app for rapid data collection. It features a unique, minimalistic user interface and design to support at speed data collection workflows. With Quick Capture, georeference observations can be collected quickly while on the go or while traveling in a vehicle with an easy big button interface. This allows users to capture data and observations without needing to stop and fill out a data collection form. One of the other collect applications is the Survey123 for ArcGIS. It's a simple and intuitive form-centric solution for creating and analyzing surveys in three easy steps. You can quickly create simple or complex forms, collect data easily via the web or mobile device, and in any environment and with minimal training, thus allowing to analyze results instantly to make actionable decisions. And the last app in this series is the Operations Dashboard for ArcGIS. Operations Dashboard is a configurable web app that allows you to use charts, gauges, maps, and other visual elements to reflect the status and performance of people, services, assets, or even events in real time. From a dynamic dashboard, you monitor your activities and key performance indicators most vital to meeting objectives of your organization. The current dashboard you see here is the monitoring of sugarcane production in Brazil. At this point, I want to turn things over to Elvis for details on ArcGIS technologies I've mentioned, and he'll show you some agriculture-based demonstrations. Elvis? Thank you, Charlie. So as Charlie alluded to, we're gonna be talking about crop scouting in agriculture. And this is the basic action of traveling through a crop field while making frequent stops or observations. As such, you can precisely assess things like pest pressure and crop performance, ultimately evaluating your economic risk of disease or infestation. If there's a need to intervene with pest and or disease control, crop scouting workflows can facilitate determining the right course of action. So let's take a look at how you can immediately get up and running with a vine scouting workflow. Viticulture, like other agriculture endeavors, also requires careful monitoring and controlling of pests and disease, among other activities like crop canopy management or even just monitoring fruit development. So the, our goal here is to illustrate how you can achieve some of these tasks as a viticulturist using the ArcGIS mobile applications. You'll be able to increase your efficiency, while capturing data exactly where it's created, thereby minimizing your paper-based workflows or the risk of incorrectly transcribing data. So on my screen, I'm a viticulture manager and I've been tasked with the um, chore of evaluating the health of vines and I need to do so quickly but efficiently thereby establishing the health status of these vines based on the individual blocks where they're being grown. So I'm equipped with, with Quick Capture. Now, as Charlie pointed out, this is a big button application that allows me to quickly capture information on the go. So I've got a couple of different Quick Capture projects on my screen, one for grapevine, grapevine scouting and one for overall ag crop scouting but our focus is gonna be on the grapevine scouting. So launching that application, I'm immediately um, presented with my 
um, app on the screen. As you can see on the left, I've got the buttons which indicate the health status, so either healthy or diseased. I've got another group of buttons which will indicate the type of disease being captured. On the right side of my screen, you can see my map, and as I pan and move around, you can actually see the, the vineyards show up and some of the points that were previously collected. But, but here you see me walking through a vineyard, and it's just that simple. As I walk through the vineyard, I can tap on the screen, and you can see it captures a point at that particular location. I can continue to tap and capture um, observations just as I move along nice and easy on my screen. And you can, you can see those records accumulating at the very top of the map there. And at some point, they'll be pushed back to my, to my um, feature layer. In addition to capturing just the health status, I can also capture things like disease. So I just tapped on phimosis there, and I might tap on powdery mildew. And I've even got some of these buttons set up where I'm actually capturing an image or a picture at the exact same time. So the icons right here indicate that a picture is going to be captured. And again, the number of records, it's back down to one because everything that has been captured thus far has been sent back. And so as I pan and zoom on my map here, you can start to see those points that, were pre that I have just captured, they'll start to show up on the map. So just like that, in a very simple fashion, you're able to capture this information on the go and folks back in the office can start to assimilate that information. So let's take a quick look at what that actually means. So, so now you're looking at a dashboard. So this dashboard was configured for this crop scouting activity. And you can see on my dashboard here some of the observations that we just captured moments ago. So as I'm capturing these observations out in the field, I've got folks back in the office who are monitoring a dashboard similar to this, and they can see these observations. You can see the number of observations that are being captured. I've got a, a, a simple pie chart here showing the distribution of the diseased observations that have been captured at a, at a previous time. So I've got a number of diseases here. If I break out my legend, you can actually see what those are, the healthy, the diseased uh, vines. All of this is being captured in a nice dashboard. And it's interactive. As I click on that, you can see that I've just highlighted a particular observation, 228 observations of ESCA, and a few observations of phimosis and the different types of diseases. So why is this important? Why is this powerful? Well, now as a viticulturalist, I can send someone back out into the field to these specific locations where I captured diseased vines for a more detailed survey of what's going on in the field. So what does that mean? Charlie talked to you about survey one, two, three, which is a form-centric data collection method, allows you to basically transform your paper form into a digital um, um, technology to collect information in a form-centric way. It's used for regulatory purposes. It's used for all types of inspection. In this case, we're going to use a survey to go out and um, inspect those disease finds. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my survey form. Let's bring that up and show you precisely what that workflow looks like. So here we are in survey one, two, three. I've created a form based on the observations that were originally captured. So now I'm going to go out and capture more information with a bit more detail. So launching that form, it looks something like this. Very simple form, general information about, about my, my disease uh, location. So I have a map, of course, and here's my vineyard. I can choose a particular location, say right there, that's where, that's where we've noticed an observation, or in this case, it was, it was this particular vineyard here. We can click the checkbox and that location is captured. It captures my date. Obviously, the person who is uh, doing the observation, I can capture all of that information as well. Basic information about the environment. We're assuming that maybe it's partly cloudy. 
Um, we know it's a disease vine, so I've passed that information ahead of time from, from Quick Capture. So it, it's already pre-populated as disease because we're going over diseased in, um, areas. Um, the severity of the observation, let's just say we're going to monitor this area. And we notice it's, it's a disease, so we're going to check that box as well. And if you notice, when I click disease, I have the option here of filling out some more details about the disease. So um, it's, that's, that's pretty powerful. But in the event where I chose something like a pest, if you notice now it changes and I have the ability to enter information about, about pests. So I've, I've created um, a sort of a relevant statement there. Depending on the answer that's submitted, the form changes to adjust based on that. In this case, we're gonna go ahead and choose disease and then we'll choose the block of interest. Um, it's O3C and you could pass that information ahead of time as well. The type of disease, we'll say it's ESCA, and then enter information about um, the, the vines infected, the grape clusters that may be infected, and um, some of the nutritional issues. All of this information is, is, is um, de these are details that you as an individual can fill out in your form to your own personal taste. So let's go ahead and submit that. I'm gonna go ahead and hit submit now. And just like that, the record gets submitted and I can switch back out to, to my dashboard. So this was the previous dashboard for scouting. Now I'm doing a survey, so I'm gonna switch to this dashboard. And we were collecting in this area here. I'm gonna just refresh my dashboard just a little bit. And there you see another point just popped up. The number of observations increase, increase to uh, seven. And I have my details list set up here so that so the most recent observation, which just happened momentarily, shows up at the very top of the list. I can click on that observation and actually see precisely which observation it is or go back and look at previous observations. So this is a really, really efficient way of sending folks out into the field with a purpose, saving yourself some time, saving yourself some efficiencies, avoiding the risk of, of errors and capturing this information dynamically as it's being created out in the field. So I just showed you how we can use Quick Capture and Survey123 in, in combination to capture it, information out in the field, information about your vines, but now let's take a step back and actually show you how I got here. How can we briefly and quickly configure something like this using one of our templates or using the template that Charlie mentioned so that you can get up and going today? So we'll start with Quick Capture. I'm in the designer of Quick Capture. This is where everything begins. It begins with a feature layer, so I could start by creating a new project, and by doing so, I can start from a template, and this is a pre-configured feature layer with all the different fields and data and information that you wanna collect from, or you can start with an existing layer, right? So you have an existing feature layer in ArcGIS Online or in ArcGIS, or in, or in ArcGIS Enterprise, and you can use that as the basis to create your quick capture form. I'm going to use a project that we just showed you moments ago, and we're going to edit that project. So this is what it looked like. This is what you saw just, just on an iPad as opposed to an iPhone. Let's say we want to capture some additional assets in addition to the health of the vines. Maybe we want to capture some assets out in the field as well. So what we're going to do at this stage is we're going to add another group. So very quickly, we'll add a group here and we'll add some buttons to this group as well, right? So here we go, we can add some buttons to this group and I'm going to select that group and just give it a name and quickly call it assets. And we'll leave it at that for now and just go ahead and solicit some of our data. We know we're using this, this scouting layer here. This, this is our scouting layer of interest. And now we can scroll down and actually choose to associate this particular button with assets, right? So here are observed assets and we're going to say that it's a fixed value and we're going to put uh, maybe irrigation. And we're going to ch quickly change this label to irrigation. 
So just that quickly, and we can also quickly change the color so that it looks a little bit differently and hit save. So now an individual can actually go in to this particular project and start to capture assets around irrigation. I could do the same for this other button. I could associate it with any of the other fields. So quick capture is really, really simple. The moment I hit save, if I were to open up my form, you would have another button there to capture irrigation assets out in the field. We also showed you Survey123, so I wanna quickly go into the Survey123 designer and show you how that's, that's quickly created. So I've got a number of forms here that I've created for previous projects. But one of the neat things about Survey123 is I can go into the folder here and I can launch what we call an XLS form. So what's an XLS form? Well, it's an Excel form. Many of you are probably familiar with Excel. You've used Excel before. This is the driver behind a survey form. It's designed in this Excel form where you can create different types of data. You can create the names and label information. The overall style and look of this form is all adjusted here in this, here in this XLS, which is basically a simple Excel form. Um, the different choices that we have are set up in these choice groups right here, and they're referenced here as you, as you create the type of question that you're interested in. So I just wanted to pause for a moment and just sort of reiterate a little bit of what I've shown you so far. We talked about gaining efficiencies out in the field, being efficient and making sure that you can get your work done in a timely manner where you're actually increasing your efficiency by capturing data exactly where it's created. But at the same time, you're minimizing your use of paper-based workflows and trying to avoid um, the risk of creating error. That's where these types of workflows, that's where these types of technology come into play. So over the next few minutes, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague or my friend, Eric, who's going to actually highlight how some of his users are using some of the exact same technology that I've just shown you over the last few minutes. Eric, over to you. Thanks, Elvis. Hey, uh, great to be here to uh, talk about this uh, this really interesting project that uh, deployed uh, some really leading edge technology. And, and in a way, it's one of the most leading edge uh, precision agriculture applications that we've seen. Um, so the, the title of my presentation is uh, Efficient Centimeter Level GPS Data Collection and Management on a Vineyard. And so the challenge uh, when, the, uh, when the vineyard approached us was, hey, how do we create an efficient data collection and management system for a half a million vines? Uh, and, you know, sort of the first question might beg, is why do you want it to monitor or track each individual vine? Well, they're really interested in, in the highest quality uh, product that they can produce. And so they're, they're actually treat each vine as an asset and, uh, and do quick inspection on each one periodically and, and annotate, uh, annotate its condition. Uh, and, and various problems may exist. For example, if a vine is not producing, it might be due to irrigation or, or drainage or, uh, or disease or something along those lines. In, in past years, uh, they would use a, a paper-based form. And so if you can imagine walking between rows of grapevines and having a, a, you know, sort of a tally sheet that you mark uh, on the way down, the, walking down the, the vine rows, and then trying to compile that data and make sense of it. Uh, you know, if it was 50 vines, you could sort of keep track of that in your mind. But with a half million vines spread across many different blocks in a geographic area, uh, that becomes a very laborious and, and, uh, and difficult task. So, so the first challenge for us, uh, or the first task of this challenge is Okay, how do we how do we identify each vine? So if if I need to uh, identify it uh, somehow to apply some treatment, um, we need to give it a, a serial number or some other identifier. So 
we can communicate effectively with the the farm team on which vine we're talking about. And so there was really two methods of vine identification that were being considered. The first one was just attach a barcode, just like you would attach a barcode to a piece of clothing in a retail store. Uh, it's, you, you scan it when you go to the checkout counter. Um, the same kind of thing here is you could create a barcode, an outdoor barcode for each vine and attach it to that vine. And so when you'd walk up to that vine, you would scan it and that would bring up the record associated with that vine. But when you start looking at the costs associated with that, uh, you know, outdoor barcodes that can survive in that kind of environment cost about a dollar a piece. And so obviously over a half million vines, that's a half million dollars just to just to have the bar, cost of the barcode itself. And that does not include uh, the labor to install the barcodes, uh, the barcode scanning equipment, the barcode uh, software, management software, uh, the whole workflow back into the uh, system of record. And so we, we came up with another idea that, uh, how about we use centimeter accurate GPS location to identify each vine? Uh, so if we use survey grade uh, GPS equipment, we can map a vine uh, down to couple centimeter level. And we can do that actually fairly inexpensively compared to barcode technology. So uh, the equipment budget was about $40,000. Uh, add on another $10,000 for installation and software and so on, and you're probably up to $50,000. So it became uh, you know, a significant you know, uh, 10 to 1 cost savings over the barcode uh, method. <clears throat> so that was decided. And so the next question was, okay, what kind of data collection system can we deploy that will allow us to efficiently map all these vines at the centimeter level? And so when you look at the criteria, uh, first of all, it must be very fast. Uh, the target was about three seconds per vine. Uh, and, and it starts to make a big difference. This is a big concern for the vineyard. If it ended up taking 15 seconds or 20 seconds per vine, uh, then it would be a really labor intensive task and become quite expensive labor wise uh, if you map that out over half a million vines. Secondly, it must be very easy to teach uh, because uh, there's not a dedicated mapping staff. And so it could be a mixture of farm labor and office labor, whoever was available. Uh, and it must be easy to teach either one of these folks because they, they, they had uh, two or three systems and so maybe they had access to 12 people at any one time. And so they had to be able to rotate in and out and, and easily be able to adopt and use the technology. And so you see this picture on the right is an uh, iPhone and that was uh, the platform they were interested in using was just iPhones because they had them available. They were used to iOS already. Uh, so they want to be able to use them. And, and just to give you an idea on the far right, uh, that's a, 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 an image of the vineyard with the, the vine points uh, laid on top. Uh, and they're spaced about three feet apart to give you some idea. So if you can imagine uh, <clears throat> three seconds to, to get from one vine to the other, press the button and, and keep on moving. That was the idea. And then it must be reliable and work all day. Uh, this is a bit of a challenge in, in some scenarios with the iPhones, but we've got an extra battery pack that we include with those. Uh, and it became a, a handheld type of uh, uh, ergonomic. And I'll, I'll show you an image here in a second. So the third task was, okay, let's say we collect all this data, um, half a million points. You know, how are we going to manage it? Because part of the challenge is that they've actually had the vines map before over time, uh, over last decade, uh, and they mapped it at the submeter level, uh, which is which became a bit confusing because the, the vines are only separated by three feet. And so if you have a submeter receiver, you can start to mix vines up fairly, fairly easily. But really the, the biggest issue with the previous mapping effort was there was no system of record. Uh, and what I mean by there's no big bucket that, we, that they would put a central bucket that they would load all the data into and manage it in that bucket. It was sort of spread out among different applications on different computers. And, and then when you tried to combine them all together, they wouldn't line up right. And so the data management part of it really became an important uh, uh, task 
uh, for the vineyard. And so um, it was, uh, it must have spatial integrity. So we, you know, be able to deal with different mapping datums and uh, it will, in this, this system would become the spatial data system of record going into the future. It will be the gold standard. And again, it must be reliable and, and able to handle, you know, half a million records of vine data plus uh, all the imagery behind it, uh, future data, for example, inspection data. Because it's going to be an ongoing project, this first phase was only just to establish the centimeter position of each vine. There will be an ongoing effort to inspect each vine and update the records in the database. And so this data management system had to be powerful enough to, uh, to accommodate uh, today's data and the data moving forward. So we went through uh, a, a pretty exhaustive search uh, to find an optimal uh, data collection and management platform. And the, what we ended up selecting was the ArcGIS Online platform as the data management platform. Uh, it's, it's powerful enough to handle the volume of data we were, we were talking about. It's reliable. Uh, it's a hosted service. And so um, it, it, we're not relied on, on local servers uh, or our own computers. If something happens, uh, it's safe in the cloud. <clears throat> and then also, uh, Esri has a suite of mobile data collection apps. And this actually really became an important, a really important uh, concept for us because, you know, in the beginning, uh, using a product like Quick Capture, which was the initial rollout application, that allowed us to map the, the vines very efficiently. We ended up hitting that um, five second, three to five second target of mapping from vine to vine because Quick Capture is, is super easy. It's a one button operation. Uh, we could train people in, in really a matter of minutes to be able to use it. But Quick Capture was just the, the, uh, the application sort of in, in task one. Uh, if we look down the road um, with the inspection task, for example, there's, there's, uh, there's no doubt we're gonna use the survey one, two, three form like what Elvis talked about previously is to be able to walk up to a vine or walk past it because you know they're so efficient, they're not going to stop and spend three minutes at a vine. They're, they're almost never gonna stop walking. They'll walk by a, a vine. If they see a problem, they'll hit a button, uh, noting that, and then uh, and move on. And so uh, Survey123 is built really well for that. It, it, it's got a data collection form and can have many different uh, um, selections in terms of is it uh, irrigation problem or a drainage problem or a, or a disease problem or whatever. And then the third application is ArcGIS Collector, which is a, is a really comprehensive uh, mapping, mobile mapping software. And we could envision using that to map the irrigation system, the drainage system in the vineyard, the infrastructure of this uh, in the vineyard. I mean, it's a, uh, if any of you are farmers or operate agricultural operations, you know how much infrastructure is out there. And, and so the collector application is really well suited for mapping those uh, kinds of features. So. And all the data from all three of these apps is fed into ArcGIS Online seamlessly. You don't have to do anything different. And they all can run on the same platform. This, the vineyard shows to run it on iOS, but <clears throat> you could easily run all three of them on, uh, on Android too. So that flexibility really made it the ideal choice uh, for this application in terms of data collection and data management. <clears throat> And just to give you some uh, some images of what this looked like, there's on, again on the left there's the uh, iPad screen. Uh, it's got one button to to capture the uh, the vine location. And actually, we ended up moving that button down to the middle of the screen to make it a little more accessible to people. Um, and so uh, the workflow is that the person would walk up to the vine, steady the antenna over the vine, take a second to do that, hit hit the capture vine button. It records the position in a second and then they move on to the next vine. The, the picture in the middle is uh, the picture of the device. There's an iPhone uh, mounted on this, uh, this uh, bracket, and you see the, the EOS GNSS receiver attached to the bottom. And again, this is all giving you survey grade accuracy based on the location of that antenna. So you just all you have to do is plummet over the top of that, that vine uh, within a reasonable tolerance. So you can see the picture on the right, the operator's uh, taking a, a shot on one of the vines. 
Um, and again, if we look at the timestamps between vines, um, we're at about five, that three to five second range. <clears throat> and so in terms of data management, once the data is collected, this is, this is what it looks like back in the office. And what's interesting is that um, the vineyard could have two crews out mapping and, uh, and, the, and the, uh, the data manager could be back in the office watching these points populate uh, in real time. Uh, and it's, a, it's really a lot of fun to watch as they, as they move along and you can see how efficient they are. So uh, I'm going to switch over to the to a live screen this is a screenshot here but i'm gonna switch over to a live screen of arcgis online which is the data management platform so this is a one part uh, a few blocks of uh of vines um in the in the vineyard uh and i just uh tapped on the layer to display the vines and so each one of these points is a vine and, and by the way we're sort of midstream uh, into the project. Uh, it started uh, in March and there's still data collecting. They, but uh, they did collect uh, 60,000 vines uh, faster than they thought they would, so just under two weeks. So I'm going to zoom in and just look briefly at uh, what these look like. So this is one uh, block of vines, and you can see these are spaced out. There's an ID. So, so each vine, the goal here, remember, was really to get a a centimeter accurate position for each vine and then have a row number and if you can see there, there's a row number attached to each one but if we just click on that vine it we got specific information about it which which receiver it was collected from because we didn't want to be confused whether the iphone was using its own internal gps or using the uh, survey grade gps the eos gps it gives us horizontal accuracy vertical accuracy both at a centimeter uh, and then we have a uh, row number which is row number 23 for this one and then a, uh, a, a timestamp, um, and as well as an elevation too. So you could actually make a uh, an elevation contour map from this. Really, just a, a really. In fact, the the vineyard was a bit concerned about the uh, ArcGIS Online platform being too complicated, uh, but it uh, but they were surprised by the ease of editing data because invariably you're going to find people make mistakes in the field. They'll do a double tap on a capture vine and have two points on top of each other, um, but they found it's really easy to go into ArcGIS Online and edit that data, uh, either call it or, or amend it. Uh, so the, and the other thing is this visualization tool. So I'm gonna switch to a 3D view of this. So this is the it, this is all within in ArcGIS Online. You have a 3D scene viewer. And these are, uh, this is an oblique view uh, overlaid on uh, a digital elevation map. I'm going to sort of scroll around here and show you how really dynamic this is. Uh, it's just amazing how cool this is to sort of visualize the, the topography and how this fits. There's a lot of elevation change, and I forget, it's probably three or 400 feet of elevation change uh, in all the blocks. And this is only one part of the block here. This is it's kind of neat. Um, if you look at uh, up here in the upper uh, sort of right corner, there's one solo dot up there, and that's actually the the base station for the GPS that's broadcasting centimeter corrections down to the users here in the field. But these uh, these brown spots are all over here by the base station, are also other vine blocks that are going to be mapped uh, eventually. So this is a really a great visualization tool uh, for managers uh, or, or product. Uh, um, project managers to be able to show this to executive management and, and have them really quick, quickly visualize uh, uh, the value and, and, and the effort that's going on here. So I'm going to switch back to PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, we ended up deploying high accuracy EOS uh, Gold GNSS receivers. Uh, and they were the, they were the most cost effective method of identifying fixed assets versus the barcodes, right? And it, whether it's uh, whether it's the fixed assets or vines or buildings or or irrigation pipe or, or drainage or utility poles or whatever, uh, the same tool can be used for all those different mapping applications. Uh, secondly, quick capture on a smartphone or, or it could be a tablet is is a very fast data collection workflow that that can be taught to 
entry level labor for large scale data collection projects like this. <clears throat> and then lastly, the really important piece is, uh, is the ArcGIS Online component. It's it proven to be a, a powerful and flexible system of record capable of handling large volume of JS data. And really, really that's the, the, uh, the ultimate here is um, you really need a, a, a system of record that's going to be permanent. Uh, they didn't want to run into the same problem before where data sets ended up uh, on different computers and different software systems. And when you try to combine those, it was just a mess. And so this ends up being a, a great system of record for them uh, moving forward. So that's uh, that's all for me. That's my contact information. Um, and I'll pass it back to Charlie. Excellent. Eric, thank you very much for sharing that. I think that was fantastic. Um, it was uh, super informative. Also want to thank Harlan Estate for allowing us to show some of their data and how they're using the technology for that. And obviously EOS positioning systems as well. Uh, they're Esri business partner doing great things and we're very happy to be uh, working with everybody in this. Um, like I said, those are amazing examples of data collection and uh, at an amazing level, frankly. Um, also too, you know, Elvis demonstrated us earlier these environments of quick capture and survey one, two, three, and showed you how easy they are to set up and configure. And, and that allows you for obviously fast deployments in what you're doing, and that makes everything super valuable for that. Um, as I mentioned, and I think I explained to somebody in one of the questions too, is that Elvis is using a template, and that template will be available to you guys to download as well. So you can have that sort of as a primer to get started, or of course you can always build your own uh, what you want to do. Uh, there'll be a, a, a link later in the slides here that, uh, and as well as in the follow-up email to, uh, in the send out that will uh, give you that information. So now um, we have some time left. Um, we'd like to answer as many questions as uh, time permits um, that we can get to and give complete answers right here. Be sure to enter them in the GoToMeeting webinar dialog box like you see on the screen. Uh, Elvis, myself, and Eric will do our best to answer these, time permitting. Okay. So let me, I've uh, got a couple of them already here. A uh, first question comes in saying, uh, you mentioned a lot of different mobile apps uh, for your, as examples. Can you explain why you'd use Quick Capture over, say, uh, collector for ArcGIS. Um, Elvis, can you uh, give us some insight in, into that, please? Sure, Charlie. So, um, collector is 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 map centric. It's it's really about the location. I mean, all these apps to some extent are about location and and capturing information based on location. The biggest difference between collector and quick capture and the reason for using quick capture is we wanted to minimize the user interaction. It needed to be quick, capture the location and whatever um, attribute information is associated with that location and move on to the next point. So, so for those reasons, um, quick capture made the most sense because we wanted to really minimize the interaction of the user. Capture, move on, capture, move on. In some cases, we're actually moving in a vehicle and there is no time to actually stop it. We're just capturing the information rather quickly on the go. Excellent, thank you. Um, another one, um, this would be uh, for Eric, it looks like. Can you tell me what Esri applications allow you to integrate with GNSS? Yeah, Charlie. So uh, that was sort of the beauty of this also is that Quick Capture, Collector, Survey123 all integrated with EOS uh, GNSS receivers. And so depending upon the application, uh, for example, just a pure vine mapping, Quick Capture was the right application. And I'll echo what Elvis said about the three different applications. Uh, the reason we didn't use Collector just to quickly map is all we wanted to do was to collect the row number or the row ID and the position and that was it. Now, moving forward, when we go to do uh, 
uh, mapping the drainage system and the irrigation system and you have uh, forms that you uh, want to fill out or attributes you want to record for example if a certain valve type you want to record uh, collector is a much well better suited application for that uh, that type of thing so quick capture is good just what it says it's super quick single button you can make the user interface whatever you want uh, collector is purpose built for more complex data collection applications okay fantastic okay um, another question here is um, are these applications available uh, in enterprise or are they add-ons that's a that's a great question so depending on the user roles in your organization um, most of these are included right uh, actually in a later slide and in the follow-up email we'll provide you with a link to uh, a really nice uh, PDF that talks about user roles and what's included with it or what potentially could be an add-on. So there's a lot of different ways you can position this to, uh, to use this technology. So, and it's always geared towards making it what's best for you in terms of how you're doing it. So that's, that's super. Um, here's a question I thought was really interesting. Um, uh, if you go, going through Vineyard is in real time, is time consuming, absolutely. Any chance to collect data through drones, RGB, and multi-spectral? And let, let's start with Elvis, but maybe Eric will have some ideas about it too, but Elvis, why don't you give us some feedback there? Y yes, I, I, we, do, uh, we do have some use cases with customers actually using um, drones to, um, capture imagery and actually do things like vine counts um, um, out in the vineyard. So again, it you know the spacing and th and things like um, like cover crop will will affect the accuracy of those type of results. But um, I'd like to you know find out a little bit more where 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 the question is going. But the overall answer is that is yes. I we we do have some customers using drones to to um, to capture it, to to capture um, imagery around vines and then coming back and analyzing that imagery um, to to essentially count the vines and and understand a little bit more about about the 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 health the overall health of the vines through 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 different vegetation indices. Good, um, Eric. Any comments or? Yeah, actually, yeah, that's a great question because you know we considered that. You know, I've, I've been a drone pilot for uh, a number of years. Uh, and and one of my initial thoughts was, wow, can we can we just fly this and then from that determine uh, the accurate location of each vine? Uh, and and when we start when I started to go down that path, um, you start to think about things like, oh, can I you know can we get it accurate enough? Because remember, and I didn't discuss this before, but one of the purposes of locating the vine down to centimeter accuracy is so that we can draw a geofence around it. Let's say, for example, a six inch geofence around that vine. And so later when we take the survey one, two, three application and to do the inspection on the vine, all we have to do is walk up to that vine. And once we pierce that six inch geofence, it automatically pops up the record to that vine. Uh, and so uh, I didn't think that we could get, you know, based on the imagery from the drone, accuracy at that level because you have you know a lot of foliage on the vine so you really don't get to the you really can't see the uh, the stem of the vine and then also there's a there's quite a few of the vine blocks that are right along the tree lines and and I was afraid that we couldn't uh, um, be able to resolve those at, at sort of the centimeter type level but I will say that I think I'd love to eventually fly this and I think we will because we could um, we could get some value out of it from a multi-spec standpoint, you know, instead of, uh, of walking through each each vine row, you know, every three months or, or whatever, maybe we could fly it. Um, but I, I still think it's having that boots on the ground gives you sort of a granular view. And, and again, they're looking at the highest quality uh, crop production. And yes, you can use drones to derive imagery and, and uh, and multi-spec from some of that, but uh, it hard to, it's hard to beat boots on the ground sometimes. Yeah, absolutely, tried and true. Um, uh, this is, uh, I, you may have answered this already too, Eric, but there, uh, someone asked what model of GNS receiver 
uh, did you use? Yeah, so we used the EOS Gold GNSS receiver. And actually, I didn't go much, too much into the technology, but that remember that red dot up sort of away from the vineyard was we set up a base station, a permanent base station up on the top of a mountain that's powered by uh, solar uh, panels, and it's got a Verizon uh, modem on it, so it broadcasts corrections 24-7. Uh, and there's also actually a radio transmitter up there too, a UHF radio transmitter, because not all parts of the vine blocks have cell connectivity. And so in some cases, we'll have to use uh, UHF radios for that, which is it's pretty common in agriculture, but just uh, I thought I'd note that. Okay, excellent. Um, here's a, a good question. Uh, I'll give this to you, Elvis. Is it for survey one, two, three and quick capture, uh, can you work with this with uh, without access to mobile data? In other words, can you do this with offline data collection? Is that possible? Uh, yes, yes, you can. Um, so not just with those tools, but um, but all of our tools um, are designed to work in an offline mode, so that the information will actually get stored on the device, and once you then get back into connectivity, um, you can. Um, you can push that information back to your feature layer. Okay, excellent. Here's a here's another good one I, I like because um, I've seen other clients ask this as well. Um, is is it possible for the software to access agricultural chemical databases to incorporate application recommendations into reports? And the simple answer is yes. We, we uh, I think I have a couple that might be doing it already, but we certainly have talked to, to some clients about that as well. Any any thoughts on that, Elvis? Yeah, uh, Charlie, that's a, that's a great question, and and we can obviously see where that question is coming from. Yeah, we do have a number of ways to actually um, integrate with other. Um, bits of technology and other databases. So tapping into those APIs, we can we can make those databases part of your uh, um, of your form. So basically you're pulling information directly from those databases. I we uh, that's something we we'd uh, definitely talk about on a case by case basis. It's not something we offer um, out of the box because um, it's not something everyone needs um, um, nonetheless. But um, we do have a number of customers doing precisely that, integrating with other um, uh, chemical databases. Good, good. Um, here's one. Here's I like this question a lot, and uh, maybe because I can answer it quick easily, but. Uh, are there tutorials about integrating data using Quick Capture Survey 123 or GS Online? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, there are areas, if you go to learn.arcgis.com, you'll find lots of different uh, paths in which you can uh, find um, programs or tutorials or uh, ways in which you uh, collect, you can learn the technology on a as you uh, seem uh, as you seem fit time basis too. So absolutely. I don't know if uh, Elvis wanted to add anything to that or not. But. So Charlie, in addition to, to the learn um, um, lessons that people can pick up on, um, keep your eyes open for a number of different blogs that we put out that also highlight some of the different workflows that, that you can undertake to get up and running with some of these applications. I found that some of the blogs can be quite helpful because they really dig into um, some of the the details of the of the different tasks that you would undertake to 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 get up and running. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, here's a question: Any similar work being done on corn soybean fields? Um, I'll start this off. Uh, the simple answer is yes. There are certainly people using it. Um, not not just corn and uh, soybeans, but we're seeing all kinds of other permanent crops as well too. Uh, uh, berries and almonds and you you name it, uh, all kinds of different areas that they're using operations like this. And sometimes it's sort of crop, crop scouting during the in season, or uh, it might be after analysis being done, like uh, multispectral imagery, and they'll find areas of interest, and they'll go out there with a to do a uh, to do a survey or a quick capture on truthing the data. So we see it in a lot of different areas. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the granular level we saw right here. That was a, a fantastic example. But there's all types of different ways in which you can do this that really uh, not is only not only in granularity of how much data you're collecting and or 
uh, analyzing, but in the size of it. It could be at a farm level, it could be at a corporate farming level, it doesn't really matter. You can, you can do it in a number of different areas. So, um, in survey one, two, three, do you have the option to select multiple items in an area where you could select disease, pest, et cetera, and then have multiple data form areas pop up? I'll, uh, I'll put that on you, Elvis. How's that sound? Yeah, so if I understood the qu question correctly, um, they're trying to in, uh, select multiple, um, maybe have mul select multiple diseases when you get to a particular location. Um, in a lot in the example I showed, for the most part, I was I was using a question type called select one, which allows you to select um, one one answer, but but there's also the ability to select multiple. So you get to a particular location or you're answering a question that requires multiple answers, you do have the option to select multiple answers as well. So that is a capability built into survey one, two, three. Okay, excellent. And uh, let's see, uh, here's one more. This is uh, probably for Eric, I would say. Um, first of all, I say good morning. That's very kind of them. Uh, on, on the use of e EOS receivers, I would love to understand if one needs to create new templates on it as well, or does it work seamlessly with Quick Capture and Survey 123? Yeah, so it's really pretty straightforward. Uh, all you have to do is to Bluetooth connect uh, your iPhone or Android device uh, to the EOS receiver and then it automatically re replaces the, the position of the internal GPS of those smart devices. Uh, so it's really, it's transparent. So uh, if you, in fact, if you disconnect Bluetooth and, and just, uh, and we run the Vine app and Quick Capture, it would just use the internal GPS uh, uh, of the phone itself. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's really seamless. The, the only, uh, the only, I guess, complexity would be you, we run a the EOS utility app in the background, EOS Tools Pro, and that allows us to access the RTK base station that was back up on that ridge uh, just by typing in the uh, the, the IP address and the, and the port number of that Verizon modem. Or if we're using the UHF radios, actually, you don't have to do anything. You just plug it in and go. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, we're just about done here. Uh, we've actually gotten an unbelievable amount of questions and we super appreciate that. We will get to these. We'll answer every single one of them through uh, correspondence with you. Um, so um, what I would like to say here is, first of all, there's our contact information, our presenter information for us. Um, uh, myself, Elvis, and Eric, feel free to reach out on an individual basis, but Again, we'll look at those questions and, um, and answer them accordingly. Um, I'd also like to offer to you to say maybe you should join the Esri Agriculture Group on LinkedIn. Uh, very simple. When you go to LinkedIn and you log in, just in the search window, search on the, the words Esri and Agriculture, and it should come right up uh, as the first one or first couple. And it's a, a group where our customers get together and can ask questions and we share information and uh, just a whole community-based type system that's frankly really run by you. And we're, we're actually building more and more uh, interaction with you guys through a lot of different methods. Um, our landing page for Esri information is at esri.com slash agriculture. You can go there to again to find use case, uh, different studies, papers, uh, information about products, so on and so forth. Um, Elvis showed the template today, we talked about it. You'll, you'll get this link in the email follow-up, but if you either are doing a screenshot or, or hit the, or go to it right now, you can see where you can get to that template as we speak. So again, it'll be available in the follow-up video so that you can see that for that. And then I mentioned about ArcGIS user types, and then here's also a, a shortcut to get to the, so you can understand what types of products are there and what's available at different user type levels to do it, uh, do their business. So we thank you for your time. Uh, hope this is beneficial uh, and um, please stay safe everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.